I need to figure out a way of avoiding trailers. There was a moment in one of the Ant-Man trailers that reminded me of one of my favorite posts from Hyperbole and a Half by Ali Broche. She wrote, I remember being endlessly entertained by the adventures of my toys. I didn't understand why it was fun for me, it just was. But as I grew older, it became harder and harder to access that expansive imaginary space that made my toys fun. I remember looking at them and feeling sort of frustrated and confused that things weren't the same. I played out all the same storylines that had been fun before, but the meaning had disappeared. I could no longer connect to my toys in a way that allowed me to participate in the experience. There's a scene in the Ant-Man trailer that captured that phenomena for me in reverse. Toys on an epic scale, the expansive possibility of imagination that can conjure something epic out of the minute. The scene was so clever and thoughtful that it had a dramatic impact on my expectations for how Ant-Man might juice up the MCU formula, which still tastes good, but after the last Avengers movie, I'm worried maybe beginning to spoil. An adult's magical exploration of the minute was, to me, the obvious opportunity for adventure with Ant-Man's powers, and while the movie flirts with that magic once or twice, it is mostly content just being another capable and entertaining movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've seen this movie already, with a different coat of paint and maybe a different grill, and if you enjoyed it then and haven't gotten tired of it yet, you're going to enjoy it here. Paul Rudd is the reluctant, and since it's the MCU, quippy hero who meets Michael Douglas, the sage tutor. Douglas introduces him to the Ant-Man suit and sends him on his quest to save society as we know it. There's a training montage, some characters who don't believe Paul Rudd is the man for the job, the crazy pants villain who doesn't understand how anyone can believe they can stop him. Did you think you could stop the future? We get a few competent action sequences and one really good one. There's the point when it looks like the hero isn't going to win, but in the end he saves the day. Maybe with the aid of his humorous sidekicks. Whoa. Pretty good, right? We do get a few moments of childlike wonder where Paul Rudd is exploring cavernous pinholes or running from enormous crushing feet. But for a lot of the movie, he's running through air vents in this futuristic research facility that are completely nondescript and might as well be hallways on J.J. Abrams' Enterprise, which spoils the magic of Ant-Man's abilities a little. I was hoping that casting Paul Rudd might shake up the formula a bit too, as he seemed like such an unlikely choice for a superhero movie. And there are a few moments where Rudd seemed to be his hilarious improvisational self. Mostly, though, rather than Rudd's presence opening up new opportunities in the story, Rudd seems muffled and contained within the standard hero role. One thing these movies really seem to have a problem with are the villains. An endless cavalcade of forgettable characters played by competent or even great actors, and Ant-Man's Darren Cross played by Corey Stoll feels no different. If you swapped him with Jeff Bridges, Obadiah Stone, and Iron Man 1, I honestly couldn't tell the difference. I'm not sure why the Marvel movies have such a problem creating interesting villains. Of course, the one exception to that is Loki from Thor. Yes, I agree with you. He's so much better than any of the other villains that Marvel has used him three times already and Joss Whedon tried to include him in the Avengers Age of Ultron. Tom Hiddleston stated in an interview that he decided to do Thor 1 when Kenneth Branagh told him he wanted to create a movie in which Thor or Loki could be considered the protagonist, depending on your point of view. And while I don't think Branagh was completely successful in accomplishing that, what we ended up with was one of the most well-motivated and properly developed villains in the the MCU. Corey Stoll has some cursory motivation in that maybe he and Michael Douglas had a whole father-son thing going on. Also, shrink rays could be affecting his brain? Maybe? That's about it. But really, most of the drama in the whole movie is wafer thin. There's no Tony struggling with his fear of death or Cap feeling like a man out of time. Conflicts seem to rise and fall between characters almost arbitrarily. As an example, very minor spoiler here, Evangeline Lilly plays Michael Douglas' daughter, angry at Douglas because he has never explained to her what actually happened to her mother. About ten minutes after we the audience find this out, Michael Douglas just out and explains the whole thing to her and the rift is resolved, almost as though it never happened. But I digress. I was going to put together a spoiler section of quibbles, but decided against it. Getting into a protracted rant about the logical fallacies in the movie about a shrinking man felt like I was being dumber than the script. I haven't yet figured out where the Mendoza line is for sufficient intelligence in an action movie, but it is enough to say that Ant-Man is just over it and in the green, even if the movie does have a scene where a guy shoots an ant with a bullet. This is an incredibly watchable movie. These are charismatic actors, the special effects are top-notch, the action is fun enough, and there is enough humor throughout to prop up the flaccid drama. I would rank it somewhere in the middle of the MCU origin movies. For your reference, there are two stingers, one after the primary credits and one at the very end of the entire credits, and they are both very worth it. Make sure you stay for the entire thing. Ant-Man gets a 7 out of 10. 